Hi, Jeff Spira here again, and I'm going to tell you a very interesting story today that uh, it might fascinate you. Um, I'm going to go back to 343 BC. Uh, a boy was accepted as a student of Aristotle, you know, one of the most learned men of ancient Greece. I'm sure you've heard that name, Aristotle. The boy's name was Alexander. Now, when he was 20, his father was murdered. So young Alexander ascended to the throne of Macedonia, which was one of the leading city-states of ancient Greece. Um, now, the neighboring city-states hesitated to pledge their allegiance to support the young king, and a rebellion started in Thebes. So Alexander formed an army um, and uh, quelled the rebellion, but his victory... Um, he sold every one of the 3,000 and 30,000 inhabitants of Thebes into slavery, and he, and he destroyed all the homes there. And that started his incredible career as one of the most famous conquerors of the ancient times. He went on to conquer Persia, Arabia, North Africa, and even India, uh, compromising the majority of the civilized word that was known at the time. Um, Alexander constructed a, a big city in, in Egypt. Well, it was really Libya at the time, but it was considered Egypt. And it was called Alexandria. And, um, and he put one of the most trusted generals uh, as the head of the city, and his name was Ptolemy. You may have heard that in uh, uh, Arana uh, astr astronomy circles, Ptolemy. Uh, he, like Alexander, he was educated, and um, he attributed his success to his intelligence rather than his bravado. So neither man had uh, what might be termed a lack of self-esteem, though. But Ptolemy set to build one of the greatest libraries of the world, the great um, Library of Alexandria. Um, it used to be thought it was simply a library, but as a you know repository of knowledge. But um, recent excavations in the earth have have found great lecture halls, so it was really like a university. Uh, it had classrooms, scholars, and students, and you know all seeking answers to the great mystery of the of the world. It was said that anyone passing through Alexandria was required to surrender any scripts or scrolls or maps or manuscripts that they were carrying so they could be copied. So they built a huge uh, library of information there. So um, it was called the Moseon. That's where we get the word museum. And it contained the greatest collection of books and documents ever assembled at that time. Um, Ptolemy's grandson, which who was Ptolemy III, appointed a famous Greek philosopher, mathematician, and astronomer to be the third director of the library, and his name was Aristophanes. Now, um, many of the, freak, uh, the Greek uh, scientists, scholars, mathematicians spent a lot of time at the Museon uh, in Alexandria, including Apollonius, Euclid, Archimedes, Herophilus, the father of anatomy, and an incredible astronomer named Astacurus of Samos, who believed in heliocentricity, which means that the sun is the center of the solar system, and the earths and the planets moved about them. Um, Aristocrus was persecuted by the religious leaders at the time for his uh, beliefs, but uh, it was only until Nicholas Copernicus, 1890 years later, um, decided that uh, Aristocrasis was actually right. And that was 1800 years after this. So the, the director of the library, Aristophanes, didn't just settle for, um, you know, executing his administrative duties. He, he did some pretty incredible scientific discoveries of his own. So, um, he dis dis designed an instrument capable of determining longitude, which is a person's position east or west, by observation alone. Um, this technique was lost um, over time and has not even du been duplicated until today. It took another twenty year uh, 2,000 years before measurements of longitude can be made because um, uh, Aristophanes' instrument, the Torquetum, was an interesting device. It's only now being understood. So, 
Um, and, the, and the way they determined longitude after that, which would have been in the uh, uh, 1700s and 1800s, was by using time. So they, had a, they, had, they developed a very um, precision clock that could be carried aboard a ship called a chronometer that actually uh, was allowed them to determine the longitude. So anyway, Aristophanes knew that the earth was a sphere and um, um, because, you know, Aristotle spent a lot of time at the, at the library and, and I'm sure they had conversations. And uh, so Aristophanes set out to uh, calculate the circumference of the earth, the earth. He did it by measuring um, the shadow in a nearby town called Cyrene when the sun was at its zenith in Alexandria. So it cast no shadow. Um, it, it's not a difficult geometric calculation to determine the length of a shadow in one place at the same time that is no shadow in another. So you can do the math. It's it's simple enough um, if, you, if you took uh, high school trigonometry and... Um, um, and you, you can calculate how far apart um, the center of the earth is from the surface if you know two places along the, the surface, so, and, the, and the difference in angle by the, measured by the sun. So. The precision of Aristophanes' measurements was astounding, though. Um, there's some disagreement as to exactly how big a Greek foot was, but... Um, most most uh, people say that he calculated with between two and five percent, uh, and and he calculated to be larger than the um, the Greek stadium the the dimension and that uh, that it turned out to actually be. So um, now it is said that Aristophanes sent two expeditions to circle the Earth, one traveling east and one traveling west to meet halfway around. So uh, they were equipped with numerous ships and different means uh, to determine their latitude and longitude. So they were going to meet in the middle. So um, even if it was only at an intersection of imaginary lines. So, um, so the one that traveled east, which was uh, he headed towards, um, through, the, through the Indian Ocean towards uh, Australia and that, um, was led by a sea captain named Rata, R-A-T-A, and aboard it was a navigator named Maui. Um, who They were trained in, in Aristophanes' Torquetum to determine their position. So six ships in that flotilla sailed through the Red Sea, into the Indian Ocean, around India, past Australia, and into the Pacific. Um, now, the Polynesians have a demo, demigod in their traditional folklore named Maui. Now, he was supposedly born of supernatural parents, um, but he lived himself as a man. And he lived in houses and had wives and children. You know, the Hawaiian island of Maui was named after this person. Maui told the people of the great sun god, Ra, which is the way it's pronounced in New England, and La in Hawaiian, which also happens to be the same name of the Egyptian sun god, also called Ra. Um, but one of his famous, uh, Maui's famous feats in, in the Polynesia was the, um, he claimed to have the ability to capture the sun. And he climbed up a mountain one day and he said he was going to capture the sun. And um, sure enough, the sun disappeared. So this was a solar eclipse. Now, Aristophanes and Maui would have the knowledge to uh, determine when the solar eclipse happened. Um, but that made a great impression on the native peoples of, of Polynesia um, to, to tell the people he was going to capture the sun and climb a mountain because he knew a, a, an a eclipse was about to take place. Um, the Maori, which are the Polynesian natives of New Zealand, uh, named for the belt of Orion is Tuke o Maui, or the Stars of Maui. Um, it's interesting that the collection, uh, the constellation Orion, is of special significance to the Egyptians and would have been to Maui as, as well. In fact, the Great Pyramids are laying out exactly as the stars and the belt of Orion. 
um, as it was 10,500 BC. So, um, interestingly enough, it wasn't until about 200 BC that the Polynesians began their rapid expansion into the world. So they, they were at, before that they were very present in um, in places, uh, even Japan. Uh, but Japan at the time was connected uh, 16,000 years ago, for instance, at, to uh, China and, and uh, before the sea level rose. But the Polynesians also uh, were in lands that were very close to each other. You know, the, the Indonesia and through the, uh, the Philippine Islands and, um, and Malaysia and, um, and some of the islands that were fairly close. But... Th- about 200 BC is when they started making long range journeys, uh, even weeks uh, of duration far out of sight of land. So, um, and, and they had a long, uh, and strong tradition of naming the memorizing the positions of stars. So they, um, you know, they, they, they learned that, uh, knowing where the star was, uh, which is what Maui did it, as a as a, a navigator, is lo- know the latitude and longitude of, of well, know the latitude of, of stars and where they should be in the sky. So um, Maui and Rata m- spent a considerable time in um, in New Guinea, which is part of Indonesia. Of course, there's a cave near Papua with an unusual drawing discovered in ancient writing. Um, it, <clears throat> um, they translated it as Egyptian writing in, in the uh, cave in Papua New Guinea. So um, they translated it, the earth is tilted. Therefore, the signs of half the ecliptic watch over the south and the other half rises in the ascendant. This is the calculator of Maui, and next to it was an inscription of what we now know to be the Torquetum that Maui uh, or Aristophanes developed to uh, measure longitude. So, um, so since Maui was set upon this expedition to test Aristophanes' calculation that the Earth was round, and to measure its actual circumference, the you know the only logical observation and findings would indicate a knowledge of tip of the earth's axis and the declination of heavenly bodies you know that's that's germane to modern celestial navigation techniques so um you know that it, it, it would not be uh, unusual for maui to know that and it's rather unusual to see it inscripted in a cave in papua new, new guinea so um there the drawing next to this uh, uh egyptian uh, writing was uh, was a torquetum so uh, a, a doctor uh, after that named Sentinel Rommel constructed a model from brass from the design in the cave. This is the 1990s. And um, he, because of its inclined datum plane and the tilt of the axis, uh, it was incapable of, of pretty incredible accuracy. And it was uh, capable of measuring the uh, retrograde movement of the moon as you sail east and west. So it could have been used to measure longitude uh, based on that uh, in that cave drawing uh, in Papua New Guinea. So th- this is not something that could have been done in Columbus times. And, and you know, it was one of the big mysteries of the 18th century was how to determine longitude. Um, John Harrison finally solved the problem by developing the chronometer to accurately measure uh, time so that you could take it aboard a ship and know what time it was. So. Um, anyway, up until the time GPS came along, the, the, it was done again by measuring time. So, uh, but Maui's Tarketum required no accurate timepiece. So it could be, it could be done through actual measurements. And Dr. Rommel's, um, uh, was said it was capable of measuring a sixth of the degree. Now that's 10 miles at the equator. So that's, um, that's that's pretty impressive so <laughs> and actually as you move away from the equator it gets less so um see it carved in a rock from 2200 years ago um it's pretty interesting so 
So it's very likely that um, Rada and Maui continued across the Pacific uh, and probably made landfall somewhere near Panama. You know, they explored north and south uh, as far as Baja and north and south along the South American coast uh, for over a year. Um, Maui left some carvings in a cave along the coast of South America, not too far from Quito, Ecuador. Um, so th apparently they were looking for a way through um, the Americas and didn't find it. Um, so they turned around and sailed west again, figuring that they they would that would be the way to go home. So um, pretty good evidence that Maui and Rada's uh, expedition landed on Pitcairn Island. Um, it's a really isolated piece of land in the eastern Pacific, and it was made uh, famous by uh, the HMS Bounty uh, and uh, the, you know, Fletcher Christian in 1790, who took his uh, mutineers there and, uh, and the, with their Tahitian brides to escape the... the uh, Royal Navy, you know, and they, their descendants live there to this day. So, so either at Pitcairn Island or maybe further west, um, the, the Maui and Rada's expedition ended. No, no one knows how or why a shipwreck is suspected, but they never, because they never returned to Alexandria. Um, whether they came to some horrible maritime disaster or lived out their lives on the shore of a tropical island, you know, um, by like. Fletcher Christian, you know, collect up a bunch of brown-skinned girls and uh, busy themselves with the uh, procreation of the sea spe species. <laughs> it's all conjecture, since no other evidence can be found uh, past the carvings in uh, in Quito, Ecuador. So, um, it is also thought that there was the second expedition would have sailed uh, west, which would have been from from. Uh, uh, would have been would have been out of Egypt and through the Mediterranean and across, of course, the uh, Atlantic. Um, but evidence of the voyage is pretty scant. It's very probably very circumstantial. Um, the westward sailors uh, had favorable winds and currents, and they didn't have nearly as far to go before running into the Americans. You know, the, the impenetrable landmass there. So, so. Um, you know the, you know the, the it was generally thought that the the American Indians were isolated from the rest of the world um, by the Bering Strait um, <clears throat> when it uh, when it opened up uh, during the ice ages and you know that would have been ten to fifteen thousand years ago. Um, so you know the Native American peoples their language would have diverged quite a bit from the European uh, cousins, but. Um, particularly because people think they were Mongolian, you know, so, um, but they consider the American language, English language is coming from a common root, which they call Amerind from the Gulf of Mexico to Labrador, um, with the exception uh, of a small area of New York where Iroquois is spoken. Amerind was the uh, language spoken by all Aboriginal Americans when Europe colonized it. Um, you know, there's a lot of Indo-European congates, two words of different languages that sound the same, like night in English, nacht in German, nakti in Sanskrit, notch in Russian, noche in Spanish. They all have the same meaning, right? Um, so you would expect that the uh, American in Indian language would be uh, originally from Mongolia. Um, so, but, but the closest languages with the most congates in, in Amerind, Amerind, I'm sorry, are ancient Greek and old Libyan. So it's interesting that uh, Alexandria was a system populated by Greeks and situated in what's now Libya. Um, <laughs> so anyway, um, old Libyan was kind of died out about 200 BC. So um, Another derivative of the American language is called Mi'kmaq and is spoken by the Algonquin people in Eastern Canada. And um, it has very strong old Libyan roots. Um, in an early linguist named Silas Rand in his studies of Indian languages of the 1870, 
detected quite a few Egyptian, Greek, Libyan, and Phoenician roots in the language of Algonquins. So, um, anyway, um, in there was a, 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 an explorer, a, a, an anthropologist named or archaeologist named Gloria Farley, uh, wrote a book uh, in called In Plain Sight where she describes a lot of the uh, Indian carvings in, in Central America and uh, U.S. part of America, um, Native American petroglyphs. So there's a, uh, an Egyptian dog complete with a uh, crown and flail whip, a depiction of Anubis, uh, the Egyptian god, and Ra, another Egyptian hieroglyph. So um, that appears in a lot of, uh, of American Indian carvings. Um, so um, interesting that this is also a common thing from e the Egyptian royal flail whip. Um, that, that appears in both. So um, Also included in many of the things that she discovered in American petroglyphs was uh, a clear description of a horse, um, which... There were no horses in the in the in America at the time that these were created. Uh, they didn't they didn't appear until the Europeans came back. Um, but who who but a visitor from the old world would have known what a horse looked like? So, um, and throughout the Southwest of the U.S., there are um, a lot of petroglyphs depicting uh, classic Egyptian style ships with numerous oars. But this area is a desert. You know, there are a few bodies of water, are, and they're small and most easily walked around or crossed on foot in the dry months. Why would Egyptian-style seagoing ships, as many as 80, water, 80 oars in the water, be carved as shown in the desert? You know, many of these carvings are uh, accompanied by very Egyptian hieroglyphic-style symbols. You know, just, just some thoughts here. Could the westbound fleet, you know, upon discovering there was no uh, passages across America, tried to cross overland? Um, you know, perhaps they, they sailed up the uh, Rio Grande River and, uh, and s tried to find their way through the Americas. Um, and I can imagine someone, and again, this is speculation, but... Uh, carving a picture of a ship asking the Indians, did they, did they ever see anything like that? Because they were again looking for the, for Rada and Maui who were on the, in the Pacific at the time. So just a, just a thought, but, uh, you know, there's a possibility that, that, uh, that, that could have happened, I suppose. Um, you know, maybe maybe the Indians themselves were wondering why 80-man ships were being rowed up the Rio Grande. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> so um, skeptics claim that if it were indeed Libyans or Egyptians, uh, why wouldn't they have used standard Egyptian hieroglyphs? Well, you know, very few people that were with them were literate. You know, the, the sailors certainly weren't. You know, kings and priests and a few scholars were... Uh, were literate, but most of the rest of them is, uh, were not. I mean, they, they didn't know how to write, but they would have seen these pictures, you know, at least a few symbols. Um, anyway, could, could be like, you know, gang signs. You know, they're, they're supposed to be in English, but you know, they're not very readable. <laughs> it's just done in a different style and different and hasty. You know, it's not even close to the writing you'd find in, you know, on a wedding invitation or something, you know, so. Anyway, um, so anyway, that's a that's another thought. So, you know, whether the in Egyptians influenced inscriptions throughout the Southwest U.S. and Egyptian and Libyan influenced languages of America are from Aristophanes, um, or if it's just some earlier pre-Columbian contact is unknown. So it's just uh, it would just be conjecture to to guess that there would be contact. Um, Few would dispute the eastbound fleet's existence in the South Pacific, though. Um, more than a hundred years before Christ, you know, long, North Africans, you know, walked in the New World. So uh, Maui and Rata were here, and uh, certainly uh, throughout the Pacific. Um, and interesting story. 
Anyway, um, so that's another one of my voyages, nautical voyages stories that you may find of interest and, uh, and keep your, uh, you know, su subscribe and all that. And, um, and we'll, next time one comes up, you'll uh, get a first chance to see it. All right. Thank you for watching and I'll talk to you again soon.